Yeah, I, you just did. Uh, yes. Uh, Jenny's going to jump in on the Taylor Swift uh, discussion with us. Sure, good. Um, so, the more the merrier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she will be around. She's also got a comment on a couple of the headlines, too, or at least one of them. Just one. Okay, everybody ready? Born ready. I was born ready. <laughs> This is your captain speaking. I'd like to take a moment to remind you that this show is brought to you by listeners like you who give value for value. To show your support, go to dailytechnewsshow.com slash support. We know you have a choice when it comes to getting your tech news. And on behalf of the crew, I thank you for choosing the Daily Tech News Show. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, June 22nd, 2015. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining me today, Mr. Brecky Thomason, founder of the SciCon Network of Podcasts that you can find uh, on your local internet. How's it going, Brecky? Uh, good, good. How are you? I am good, man. Uh, it's been too long. Thanks for coming back. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, well, you're up late where you are. Oh. You're, in, you're in Sweden, right? Sure, sure. It's, it's only 10.30 in the evening. Okay, that's not too bad. Thanks for no. staying up, though. Past I my know. bedtime, frankly. Uh, but <laughs> well, you're old, so it's okay. <laughs> we're going to be talking about music Sorry. and the undo... No, I've, I, you know what's funny is I've just agreed with that so much that I didn't even react. I'm like, yeah, that's true. I'm, just, I'm really old. Uh, we're going to talk about music and uh, Taylor Swift's undue influence on our lives and the, and the business model of Apple. Uh, and our producer, Jenny Josephson, is going to join us for that as well. Uh, thank you for doing that, Jenny. I represent the Outer Rim of the Swiftopia-verse. <laughs> the Swiftopia-verse? Swift. Are you a Swifty? Do you consider yourself a Swifty? Yes, Tom. <laughs> I'm just going to say, I'm one of the ones who it's too late for me, but I very much appreciate what she'll do for all our children. <laughs> <laughs> just think of the children and Taylor. Just think of the children. <laughs> Swiftopians right, cool. of the world unites. Let us check out some headlines. Uh, Google officially announced its new site called News Lab today. Justin Robert Young and I talked about it a little bit last week. TechCrunch reports that the goal of the program is to connect journalists with programs, data, and other resources. There will be tutorials and tips on the best practices when using Google products in reporting. The site will also showcase Google's new media partnerships, such as YouTube Newswire and other partnerships with Storify that we talked about last week. Um, I have one thing to say about this, which is what struck me much when I read this was Google gave us the world's information and maybe now they're realizing they need to tell us what to do with it in a responsible way because uh, we could use a, 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 a nation full of, or a world full of citizen journalists. It's not a bad thing. You think Google's looking at us saying you're holding that wrong? Here, let me, let me help you. <laughs> I mean, maybe. You're going to hurt yourself? <laughs> Point maybe. that news away from you. I, I, the world, everyone getting a free lesson in in reporting is not a bad thing, and and it really does help in places where the media is so tightly controlled by the state, and and you really do depend on citizen journalists who are now being given all these tools to broadcast and put their thoughts out there, but it helps to actually have a sense of how to do this, if not objectively, which I think has gone by the wayside, but fairly. Yeah. My thought when I saw this was this is Google reacting to the troubles they've been having in Europe, particularly with news organizations and attempting to show that they're good folks on the side of journalism. Uh, Brecky, what, what is your take on this? Pretty much the same. I, I think this is Google just trying to um, create a new environment for news and other kinds of stories to flourish uh, and obviously a, a platform that they control. Yeah, and I, I, and I don't think either one of you are wrong. Uh, I, I think they're probably both, there's elements of both in there. And, and in the end, I think it's like I was talking with Justin last week. I think it's a net positive and, and a good thing. Maybe, as Justin said, it won't have as much of an effect as they would hope, but maybe it will. The Verge reports Sony is releasing the PlayStation 4 one terabyte ultimate player edition. edition, edition. The updated machine will be 10% lighter, use 8% less power, and have a matte finish instead of the glossy finish over the hard drive bay. It'll release in Japan before the end of June and then come out July 15th in Europe and North America. Sony also released changes to the PlayStation Companion app for iOS and Android, letting users redeem gift codes without having to turn on your PS4. That's handy. Uh, and also display comments from viewers while you're streaming gameplay so you don't have to have them 
cluttering up your screen. You can just look down at your phone and have them. Any of this gear excite you, Brecky? Not at all, no. Not at least. Not a PlayStation fan, huh? Um, historically, I, I have been, but as of the past two or three years, I mean, this current generation and onwards, basically, I've been uh, mobile only, more or less. Ars Technica reports on documents leaked by Edward Snowden that show that the U.S. National Security Administration, the NSA, and the U.K.'s GCHQ attempted to subvert antivirus software in order to succeed in attacks on intelligence targets. They largely took a couple of different approaches. GCHQ attempted to reverse engineer antivirus software from Kaspersky Labs, among others, and the NSA intercepted emails to Kaspersky containing malware samples and then used those samples to bolster their own network defenses, as well as proposed reusing them to attack other intelligence targets. Is, is anybody surprised at this point? I'm glad you said that, because I, I feel I'm getting a little dead inside. Uh, it's, it's bad that they're intercepting emails to Kaspersky. I have no, no qualms about that. Uh, I have no hesitation about that. On the other hand, a uh, spy agency trying to figure out how to use malware to place on a bad guy's computer, it's sort of a gray area. I can't say I, I support it, uh, but it's, it's using the tools available, and it's certainly one of the less shocking things out there. I guess the, the worry is, well, who are the bad guys and how do they define bad guys? And it goes back to that whole issue of supervision and, and who gets to decide when they get to do these sorts of things. Right. TechCrunch reports Docker, Google, Microsoft, and Amazon are working with the Linux Foundation on the Open Container Project, a standard for software containers. Docker will contribute its container format and runtime to get the project started. Containers, if you don't know, allow software to run on almost any server, and the project will create a standard container that can then work with any runtime. So it doesn't matter whether it's from Docker, CoreOS, or somebody else. If you're into containers, by the way, it's hot stuff right now, then this is very exciting for you because this means you don't have to worry about the runtime environment. If you're not into containers, those were just a bunch of random words that didn't make any sense to you. Hello. <laughs> Reuters reports 1,400 airline passengers were stranded at Warsaw's Chopin Airport Sunday when the flight plan system went down for five hours. LOT airline spokesman Adrian Kabicki said the outage was due to a capacity attack. Essentially sounded like he was talking about a DDoS, raising the question among security researchers why the flight plan system was connected to a network that could allow for a DDoS from the internet. Uh, Brecky, this one caught your eye, I know. Yeah, it did. Because um, every time you, you hear a story about airport or airplane security, you immediately start wondering, what about planes that are actually in the air? Um, but apparently they were safe. This is only for the grounded planes. Um, the, the flight plan system just wouldn't work for planes that were about to take off and so on. But the ones already in the air were, were safe, thank God. Yeah, they couldn't file the flight plan, right. so, that, so they couldn't go through the proper procedures, but it didn't affect the operation of aircraft. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm curious, I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop on this one because that computer shouldn't be susceptible to a DDoS attack. I'm not an expert in aviation systems, so maybe there's a sneaky way they got in. Well, maybe somebody uh, wants to work from home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm often a proponent of working from home, but air traffic controllers are one of those jobs that I think probably should be done in person at the office. Yeah, I think so. Sydney Morning Herald reports the Australian Senate passed the Copyright Amendment Online Infringement Bill 2015 introduced into Parliament by Communications Minister Malcolm Turnbull. 37 to 13 was the vote. Rights holders can request a judge issue an order to block a website if its primary purpose is facilitating copyright infringement. Australian internet providers, Telstra, Optus, and others, would then need to comply with the judge's order by disabling access to the infringing location. On the surface, this is one of the more reasonable uh, copyright enforcement acts. It requires a judge to determine that a, a site was in violation and, and then and only then is blocking uh, issued. However, what is defined as primary purpose? Who bears the cost of the blocking? Is it blocking by IP address? Is it blocking by web address? How do you stop uh, companies and, and organizations who just shift to a new domain name? A lot of questions around this, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. I mean, could you even argue that the Pirate Bay's primary purpose is facilitating copyright infringement? It is what most people use it for, but it's for anybody to upload anything. It it's, doesn't have a primary purpose except for sharing whatever. Well, and uh, other people would say, oh, it's very obviously 
the primary purpose is to, to infringe copyright. What are you talking right. about, Brick? But that, and that's, that's a value judgment. Exactly. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I, I think you need a definition in there of primary purpose and how it's yeah. determined uh, before you can just let, you're going to see, you're going to see some random determinations out of here. Sure. I, here in Sweden, when we had the, uh, the entire Pirate Bay court case, um, what they did was they, uh, they started looking into how much in percentage of the bandwidth to and from the site was actually copyright infringement and how much wasn't. And they, they had some arbitrary limits. So as long as it's above a certain percentage of copyright infringement, then you can assume the site is primarily uh, aimed at copyright infringement. Uh, but again, it was all very arbitrary. Yeah. Well, because with Kazaa, if you remember way back in the sure. day, they were busted for inducement because they were saying, hey, come here and get free music, right? Pirate Bay is very careful about not saying that anywhere on the site. Uh, right. The things that are listed on the front page are things that are frequently downloaded, which are often copyright infringing materials, but they aren't picking them editorially as far as I know. It's an algorithm that just shows you what's most popular. So. Right. Uh, it's a tr it's a tricky situation, and and I'm sympathetic to the idea of saying, hey, you know, we want to stop people who are breaking the law. I think you need better copyright laws to begin with, though, before you even get to this point, and then you need to have very strict uh, enforcement of copyright infringement standards, and you need to allow for fair use uh, and safe harbor. Uh, it's just poorly conceived. That's yeah. the problem. Newly unsealed court documents by The Intercept reveal the U.S. Justice Department won an order forcing Google to turn over more than a year's worth of data from the Gmail account of Jacob Applebaum. He was a Tor developer who worked as a volunteer for WikiLeaks. The order also prevented Google from notifying Applebaum about that order. The Justice Department argued that Applebaum had no reasonable expectation of privacy. They also asserted that journalists have no special privilege to resist compelled disclosure of their records absent evidence that the government is acting in bad faith. Google's attempt to overturn the gag order was denied by Magistrate Judge Ian, I'm sorry, Ivan D. Davis in February 2011 and denied on appeal in March 2011. Poor guy, First time yeah. we're actually hearing one of these things. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I, I followed um, Jacob uh, Applebaum on Twitter for a while and the stories that he tells about, you know, just the, the kind of things that he has to endure at airports and so on. The, the way that he, you know, would copy things onto a USB stick and post it to him just because he knows it's going to be taken from him at the airports. Yeah. Uh, this is a guy who, who I would imagine has taken advantage of a hidden volume in TrueCrypt at some yeah. point or another with a really good reason versus the rest of us who might have tried it just, you know, for kicks. Uh, he's, he's living a much different life. Hey guys, remember the emotional robot that Justin Robert Young and I were talking about last week? Uh, the one that was going on sale in Japan this past weekend? Well, CNET reports that SoftBank's Pepper robot sold out a thousand robots in one minute. Uh, Pepper, if you remember, cost 198,000 yen, it's around 1,600 bucks. SoftBank plans to produce a thousand units a month with the next batch plans for launch in Japan in July. So for one minute a month, you'll be able to buy a Pepper robot in the foreseeable future. If you're confused about whether you can get Windows 10 for free as a preview user without upgrading from a previous genuine install, either go read The Verge's article by Tom Warren or listen up. Uh, he made it very clear to me. He interprets Microsoft's Python-S-like pronouncements to mean the following. Anybody who does a clean install of Windows 10 Preview Edition and is in the preview program and then continues to agree to receive pre-release updates can keep using the OS for free for the foreseeable future. Anybody else, if you stop getting those pre-release updates, will have to prove that they once had a genuine copy of Windows 7 or 8 if it was a clean install. And if it wasn't a clean install, you're good. So there you go. Clean it, cleared up. Any questions? No? Good? All right. Time for some news from you. These come from our subreddit, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Captain Kipper sent us the news that Taylor Swift has changed the flow of time. I mean... Uh, Singer-songwriter Taylor Swift wrote a super polite open letter to Apple on Sunday morning telling them that their plan to not pay artists during the three-month free trial period of the forthcoming Apple Music program was, quote, shocking, disappointing, and completely unlike this historically progressive and generous company, and that she would be withholding her mega-popular album, 1989, from the service. By Sunday evening, Apple Media Chief Eddie Q announced on Twitter that Apple would pay artists an undisclosed amount per stream for listens during the free trial. And all over the world, 
glitter fell from the sky, and enlightened citizens of the T Swift Diverse rejoiced. We're out of the uh... woods. We're going to talk about that more. We should have, I should have had this one at the end of the lineup because uh, we're going to talk <laughs> about that in a second. But before that, in a moment, uh, first of all, Daniel H. Price, 1986, submitted the Globe and Mail article on how U.S. intelligence officials followed Chinese hackers for more than five years, then lost the trail last summer. It is alleged that these same groups gained admin privileges in the networks of the U.S. Office of Personnel Management, the OPM. Uh, if you remember that, OPM suffered an attack that gained access to personnel records. Much of the data was stored on lightly protected systems because of the cheap available storage space. Pay for your security, people. That's a look at the headlines. All right, let's get into the effect of Taylor Swift on the universe. Uh, here's the timeline. So Taylor posted her Tumblr post, very, very politely worded. However, the, uh, she did assert that you should pay artists for the first, for the free three months of the trial because she doesn't need the money, she said, but lots of India new artists do. And if their album came out during that period that someone is free trialing, it, it could definitely hurt them. She said, she wrote, I can support myself, my band crew, and entire management team by playing live shows. Interesting phrasing. This is about the new artist or band that has just released their first single and will not be paid for its success. So question one is, well, don't most even indie and small artists make their money off live shows? Uh, anyway, by 8.29 p.m., Apple had bowed to her wishes. Eddie Q uh, had written on Twitter, Apple Music will pay artists for streaming, even during the customer's free trial period. He, he wrote, we hear you, Taylor Swift, 13, and indie artists love Apple. At 9.34 p.m., Taylor Swift responded, I am elated and relieved. Thank you for your words of support today. They listened to us. So she didn't respond to Eddie Q. She was talking to her fans. Uh, and essentially, uh, what happened was Eddie Q got up, read that Tumblr post in the morning, uh, called up Tim Cook and said, you know, uh, we had originally negotiated these deals based on paying them a higher royalty rate on an ongoing basis to compensate for this brief time. And that was my speculation, was that they made the deal with the music labels and said, great, we'll give you a higher percentage. We'll give you 73% or 71% of the royalties instead of the standard 70 if you and you agree to give us three month free trials that we don't have to pay royalties on. The label said great. The artists not so excited about that. So Brecky, th is this an example of everything just all working out and Apple saying, ah, you know what, we got the cash to cover this. Taylor's right. Uh, let's help everybody out. It was just an honest mistake of negotiations. Uh, what, what do you think is really going on here? Uh, I think to a certain extent that's exactly what this is. I mean, this is, uh, it's not David versus Goliath here. It's, it's Goliath versus Goliath. Uh, just two, two separate organizations or a person and an organization um, who have slightly different opinions on how to do things. And Apple realizes that, well, maybe Taylor Swift is right. And um, I like Apple because they, they are known to change their minds. Uh, if they do something that they realize is not right, they change their mind. And um, this is apparently another one of those things. I'm still waiting for them to change the entire 70-30 model, though. Um, I was really hoping for them to do that at WWDC, uh, and a lot of uh, fellow developers were hoping for an 85-15 shift. Um, but maybe that's for the future, and maybe we'll see that happening in music first or something on those lines. Maybe they but should ask Taylor Swift to write a Tumblr post for them. Maybe, maybe. But, but essentially, I, I think this is a non-issue uh, on the whole, because... These three months, uh, they are a trial period, so it would make a little bit of sense for them to treat them slightly differently. But it also makes a lot of sense for Apple to still pay the artists, no matter if they're getting money from the users or not. Um, they can afford it. Now, Wired uh, has an article today that asserts that Taylor Swift is not only representative of the entire music industry, but is queen of the Internet. Jordan Cruciola wrote that. I know I've seen people say, no matter what Taylor Swift says in her Tumblr post, she was doing this for herself. She's holding back her album, 1989, because she wants to make money off album sales, and this was all just a bluff. Uh, Jenny, what do you think that's true? Um, I think many things can be true at the same time. Let's put it that way. Yes, and. Uh, and but it's really consistent with who Taylor Swift has been since the beginning of her career, which, by the way, was at age 13. Um, because at this point, if it seems like 
Taylor Swift has been created for the sole purpose of decimating traditional power structures. It, that may be true. Like, her dad was a financial advisor. She comes from a long line of, like, paternal bank presidents. Her mom was a marketing executive. Like, it is possible that her mom is Sarah Connor and her dad was sent back in time to create a savior and who would neutralize AppleNet. You know what I mean? Like, she, but in the more serious thing, she had a record label deal, a development contract at age 15, but RCA wanted to wait until she was 18 to release her first album because that seemed like a good thing to do, and it turns out uh, she thought her time was running out at age 15 and wanted to go uh, go faster, and so she went independent. She did what so many artists uh, uh, across all media, including podcasting, are doing nowadays, which is when a traditional power structure doesn't fit for them, there's another option. And so she signed with this fledgling record label. She drew, she did everything herself. She stuffed envelopes, she baked cookies, she created paintings for radio station programmers, which are probably now worth a lot of money. Uh, and now here she is at age 25, the youngest woman ever to be included on Forbes' most powerful women's list at 65. And frankly, after today, she's going to jump 30 spaces. She used MySpace to build a fan base. She found a new market where there was not a developed market, which was new teen, like teenage girls who liked country music. Um, she associated personally with all of her fans for like four hours before and after con thing, uh, concerts, like, you're looking at a consistent approach for her, which is if she doesn't like it, she's not going to stand for it. I don't know. I think it's fascinating. Now, Yaniv, the Latin blogger, wrote into us and said, I believe Taylor Swift lost yesterday and Apple won big time. They won in the PR by responding on Twitter, letting everyone know that they will pay the artist they have the money. Uh, the banks to, and, and the banks to do it. But now Taylor Swift must put her music where her mouth is and hand her music over to Apple. Now Apple wins since they have her in their catalog. Of course, they, they don't yet. We haven't heard whether 1989, uh, Taylor Swift's latest album, will actually be in the Apple Music streaming service. It's available for purchase on iTunes, of course. Uh, and, and I think that's what Jenny was trying to say when she said, well, both can be true. I believe it's very smart for Taylor Swift in her position with her predominance to hold back her album from streaming services in most cases because she will make more money off of it where not everybody who's as well known as her would. So what this all comes down to me uh, is, you know, is, is, this, is this just a bunch of PR battling? Or is this fundamental to the way music should operate? I kind of don't think it is. I don't think this really sets any kind of precedent. Do you, Brecky? No, no, not at all. The, the, I mean, Taylor Swift herself sets the precedent because back in November last year, she uh, pulled her music from Spotify, uh, save for, I think, one song that she allowed to stay on the sites or on the, on the service. Um, and I, I think this is just, um, it, it's partly PR, of course. She's gathering attention because she knows her albums will sell and she knows her concerts will sell. So it's not a huge loss for her. Uh, and it does drive a lot of um, attention her way. Um, um. I, I just yeah. hope that Apple doesn't compensate this by just giving everybody a free album like they did with U2. <laughs> Forcing everyone to have a free album? Yeah. yeah. I hope so, too. I think what this suggests is that Taylor Swift has the world's most demographically valuable army and that she is not afraid to wield the sword of destiny to get what she wants. And honestly, is there any better lesson for young people of any gender, it doesn't matter which, than that, which is if you want what you want, Go out and get it. Do, you know, as long as it's, you know, morally, you know, not completely suspect. But, you know, go out and pursue your passion. Pursue your career. Do what you want. If the traditional power structure uh, is not right for you, go another way. And in that way, I know people like to say she's just throwing temper tantrums. She's just doing that. But in another way, I think that is huge and amazing. And I really can't see, wait to see what she does by the time she's 30. Yeah, you can say she's got nothing in her brain uh, if you want. But I think the most interesting part of this story has less to do with Apple Music or streaming models or royalty rights. I'll take, I'll take you at your word, Jenny, that Taylor means it when she says she's doing this for independent artists. I think what Taylor's really doing, whether she knows it or not, and it could be in addition to fighting for independent artists, is engaging with her fans. Uh, she is a master at social media. 
uh, when when she went onto this Tumblr blog that she used yesterday, she immediately embraced a meme about her that was out there that a lot of people didn't even know if she was aware of or or thought was good, uh, and and she went right into it. It was a it was a Tumblr meme. And, and she took this not to the Wall Street Journal like she did when she pulled her music off Spotify. She took it directly to the fans on Tumblr. She spoke on Twitter. Uh, she, is, she is embracing the ways to communicate with her audience where her audience is and creating a legion uh, of followers that are at her beck and command. Uh, you know, the, it, she was able to make Apple listen you could say maybe she made them change their mind. It sounded like Eddie Q was saying, well, we kind of had some doubts about this already because the independent artists had uh, posted a protest uh, blog earlier last week, right? But that didn't change Apple around. What changed Apple around was Taylor Swift and her huge audience speaking out. And that, that makes her a very powerful voice. And of course, immediately yesterday, all the Twitter jokes were like, hey, can, what else can we get Taylor Swift to change? International both diplomacy? Apple and anywhere else? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you could joke about that, and I don't think she can really have an effect on international diplomacy yet. Yet. <laughs> Shirley Temple Black didn't become an ambassador until she was, you know, in her 60s, so. Uh, yeah, I, I don't Does anyone even know who that is? I know who that is. Oh. <laughs> Brecky, do you know who Shirley Temple is? Who oh, Shirley Temple is, yes. Okay, good. All right, never mind. Take it back. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I think it is an example of the power of the internet now being wielded by the power of a mainstream celebrity. And I don't think we've seen it quite done in this way before. Do you guys? No. I no, think not, not in this way. Yeah, I think she is like an independent artist at mega scale. She's not really independent label-wise anymore, but she is acting like an independent artist at at a A-list celebrity musician scale. I think it's fascinating to watch. Yeah, it is possibly just a, a weird hybrid of our times, uh, but I think there are lessons for not just musicians, but but all kinds of people who create things on the internet and how she goes about this, and how she, rela she, she relates directly to the fans. Very fast. So what do you think? Are we getting a, a red iPod special edition? <laughs> red lipstick iPod classic. Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah, maybe. Mm. You could have a James Dean looking one as well. Maybe. All I know is that I really do think she is the childlike empress from the never ending story. <laughs> That's my takeaway from all of this. You've got to look at uh, Jenny's Twitter picture at twitter.com uh, slash JennyJ23, uh, and you will agree with her. <laughs> also, she might be Galadriel, and I hope she resists the ring. Agree. Our pick of the day comes from Vance. Uh, disclosure, Vance is a huge fan of Google things, and his pick is Android TV as a set-top platform. He says it has been adapted as the smart TV interface for a number of TV manufacturers like Sony and Sharp. Uh, he likes the UI. says, while it is lacking an Amazon Prime app, it makes up for that if you use Google Play Music or videos and has the best YouTube app going and a powerful voice search function, as you would expect. Not sure that Google Play Music makes up for Amazon Prime, Vance, but I'll, I'll give you that it does have a lot of other options. Nexus Player is 79 bucks on Amazon, and while some find it a bit underpowered at the price, you not only get the Android TV and TV Chromecast can take advantage of that. Uh, which Roku can do casting, Amazon Fire TV can do casting as well, but that's a fair point. He said, I recently picked up the pricier NVIDIA Shield Android TV, and I'm very impressed so far. And that is one that a lot of people have reviewed very favorably, saying it's the best Android TV device out there. So there you go. Android TV, not only the Nexus Player, but also the Shield Android TV device. Thank you, Vance, for sending that pick along. Do you have a media streamer you prefer, Brecky? Uh, no, I, I just use the uh, Apple TV and um, stream most things from my local library. So the Apple TV is your preferred yeah. one, I guess. Yeah. Send your picks to uh, feedback. I don't even use Netflix anymore. <laughs> Send your picks to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com, and you can find my picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. All right, we uh, talked last week about Amazon's announcement that as soon as they're allowed to, uh, and if that happens by the end of the year, that would be by the end of the year, they will start delivering packages by drones. Everyone's been speculating how best this would work. Amazon hasn't said a peep about how they would do it yet, but we have a caller from Iowa who thinks he's cracked it. Hello, I just wanted to weigh in a little bit on the Amazon drone thing. Um, I think everybody's thinking about it all wrong when they're trying to figure out, okay, how are they going to do this? 
I think that the best way that they're probably going to do this is you'll get an email saying, hey, your package is ready to deliver. Click this link to select the best delivery time. You go to the link, tell it, okay, I'll be home between 5 and 7, and then they will send the drone out with your package instead of trying to figure out how to send it out and all that other stuff. So just thought I'd weigh in on it. Thank you. Now that's interesting. Depends on the drone flying time. And I, I definitely, I don't know if I like the windowing idea, but the idea that you could say, uh, okay, send it now, I'm home. I kind of like that, no? Yeah, sure. No, absolutely. I mean, it, it's a moot point because in a couple of years, we'll all have RFID chips implanted on our necks and the drones will find us. Um, but until then, this is a, a good stopgap. <laughs> yeah, I, th I, th I, think, uh, I think it's... I don't think, unfortunately, this is how they're going to do it, though. No. I, th I think it's an intriguing way of, do of thinking about it. Though. Alan wrote in and said, Modern garage door openers, like the ones since 1995, use rolling codes, the same tech on a car's key fob. We were talking about spoofing garage door openers last week. It says, basically, it uses a random number generator to determine what code to allow entry with a plus-minus range to compensate for accidental pushes and multiple vehicles. Once a code has been accepted, it can no longer be used. So garage doors are harder to spoof than you might think these days. Well, Alan's right, and yet... For some reason, I've never lived in a house that had a rolling code garage door opener. <laughs> you know, it's, have you guys had a key fob for your garage door openers? Have you even lived in places with Never had a openers? garage. Yeah. No, we, we just use the good old classic key. Yeah. And I've lived in plenty of places that didn't have garage door openers either. But the ones I did always had really old ones. So anyway, good point though, Alan, uh, about the key fob thing. So if you are putting in a garage door opener, then you should definitely look into one like Alan's talking about, not the old-fashioned kind. And that is Daily Tech News Show for Monday. Thank you all for watching. Uh, thank you, Brecky Thomason. You can find Brecky on the internet at breckythomason.com, B-R-E-K-I-T-O-M-A-S-S-O-N. And, of course, follow him on Twitter at Brecky T, B-R-E-K-I-T. But Psycon.net is where you really need to go and subscribe to all the shows. All of the shows. All at once. Every single one. How are things going at SciCon? Uh, anything in particular you want to let folks know about? Well, we've just uh, acquired two new shows, uh, The History Files and uh, Game Punting. Uh, one of them is a history file, a history show about um, just recent uh, history, the past uh, four or five hundred years, uh, educational entertainment show. And then uh, Game Punting, which is all about uh, the uh, uh, up-and-coming Kickstarter um, games, uh, oh, mainly tabletop games. That's very, really cool. So find it some gems, I would guess. Absolutely. Yeah. And the history files, is that just general history or, or technology history? Or? Uh, it's general history. I mean, oh, uh, cool. the past couple of weeks, we've had um, everything from the Magna Carta to um, the rule of law versus the rule of king mm. and stuff like that. That sounds That's awesome. So, mm. so SciCon.net, folks. C-S-I-C-O-N.net. Of course, Jenny Josephson, the host of Tell It Anyway, as well as the producer of the show. Uh, but you should go to tellitanyway.com and subscribe if you want to hear really good stories because it's the most fun storytelling podcast I've ever listened to. Aw, thanks, Tom. And I'm not just saying that because she's right there. And she will <laughs> screw up my lineup if I don't know. <laughs> show I, I listen to it thursdays right you usually come out on thursdays uh yeah we try to make it out by thursday mornings um we've been trying to do weekly we are sort of slipping to bi-weekly while i'm teaching uh but uh it's a really great road trip show in which if you're going on a long trip across america or another country this year or you're on a train in europe or somewhere it's a great companion piece to driving long distance I have found it pairs very well with We Have Concerns with Jeff Canada mm -hmm. and Anthony Carbo. A fine uh, so course. <laughs> check it out at tellitanyway.com. And that's it for us. 5,077 patrons uh, still like the show. Thank you <laughs> for supporting us. Patreon.com slash Ace Detect. Uh, the premise of this show, if, you're, if you are unclear about it or if you're new to the show, is that we make the show. If you find it valuable and you have the resources to give a little value back, uh, you can do so at Patreon.com slash Ace Detect. You could do so by PayPal or Bitcoin at DailyTechNewsShow.com slash support. If you don't get value out of the show, then that's okay. We understand. If you don't have any money that you can throw around right now, we understand that too. We ask maybe just tell people about the show uh, and let people know that you enjoy it. DailyTechNewsShow.com slash support. 
for all of those options. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. You can give us a call, 512-59-DAILY. That's 512-593-2459. Listen to the show live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern at uh, player.alphageekradio.com and visit our website, dailytechnewsshow.com. Back tomorrow with Veronica Belmont instead of Patrick Beja, who's on vacation. Talk to you then. The show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Good show, everybody. What should we call it? Well, uh, the far and away vote getter right now is Swift Justice, uh, which was submitted by Christmas. <laughs> um, let's see. We've got Down with Swift, Swift Up with Objective C, uh, Apple's new policy is tailor made, Apple <laughs> swiftly changes, uh, a swift kick to the apples, which I think really might be my favorite. <laughs> Uh, out of pepper. Uh, the Taylor Nader. Mm. I know. That I really sounds like bad. That. I know. <laughs> and Apple defeats the nothing. Paid by Apple. <laughs> paid by Apple. Oh, Swift okay. defeats the nothing. Yeah, Swift defeats the nothing. Paid by Apple. I don't quite know what the last part means, but I do like Taylor Swift defeats the nothing. <laughs> Swift kick to the apples. I really like that one. That's. I like Swift Justice. has a very uh, Chuck Norris feel to it. Yeah. And it's the leader. It's the leader. It's it's yeah. the leader. Short and punchy. Someone had a really great one in the chat room that they didn't submit as a title, but it was so good. Where was it? By the way, Tom, have you seen Jurassic World yet? Yes, I have. Do you want to talk about it next week? Uh, or this I... coming weekend, possibly? Yeah, sure. I'll send you an email. Yeah, I have, well, I, Sunday I can't. Saturday I could. Uh, or next week I don't have sword and laser, so I've got a little more of my evening time available, although that's bad for you probably. As long as it's not too late. Yeah, maybe like Monday morning though could work. Um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah just email maybe, me. And we'll I'll, I'll send you an email. Yeah. Cool. Because I'm looking for a second person to join me. Or okay. a third rather. Okay, yeah. Uh, I I liked it. Yeah, yeah. Not the best in the series, but no, good. Not enough. the best movie I've ever seen. No. But you liked it, even though it was kind of mediocre. No. Oh, I not did that. that. No, not I haven't that. seen it yet. I'm just one. I'm just basing this off your reaction or what I'm, I'm hearing saying. So far. That it's not like uh, when I saw Mad Max, where I was mm. like stunned. I just really, I couldn't, you know, I had a good time watching it. Right. It's not the summer blockbuster we hoped for, but it's probably going to be one of the top five summer movies. If you go into it looking for like an experience, you're not going to get that. No. I knew everything that was happening, but it was really paced well mm -hmm. and it was enjoyable. Chris Pratt was enjoyable. The Always. dinosaurs look good. I don't know. I don't want to do the Psycon episode before we do it though, but. No, no. I I'm like just uh, trying to. Get some people for the next uh, couple of uh, weeks and months. Um, Scott is signed up for uh, Civil War next year. Um, Brian is going to be with me. <laughs> <on>. Wow, <laughs> that's advanced. Yeah, yeah. We, we try to plan Who's ahead. got Star Wars? Uh, oh, nobody please. yet. You should have a death match, like a podcasting fight to the death to figure Seriously. out who gets to talk about Star Wars. We had um, a thing back on SciCon. Um, this is two years back. We had something called the uh, Death Match of Death and More Death. <laughs> where, where we had uh, 64 characters from geek culture, everything from you know Yoda to Wolverine to um, Fu Manchu and so on. Wow! And um, my two co-hosts would randomly pick one every single week, and they would argue which one of them would win in a fight, and then ah, the okay. audience would vote, and then it was basically a ladder match, and uh, Wolverine won at the end. He was the final survivor, the 64. Adamantium claws, man. Yep, it was him versus Gandalf in the final fight. <laughs> yeah, but it's really not his antinantium. It's the fact that he has that mutant health. Yeah, the regeneration, thing. right? Yeah, like sure. You can't kill him. Doesn't hurt. Right. And also, you he wouldn't um, take a staff from an old man, though, would you, Roger? It wouldn't and, matter. Uh, Magneto was already not, out of the fight before we got there, so. Not to kick up a thing, 
not to kick up a thing. But what's stronger, adamantium or vibranium? So that's or one of those. That's one of those things that gets really muddied in the Marvel universe, depending on which book you read. Supposedly, vibranium that the stuff that the cap shield's made of is like almost impenetrable. Uh, mm. But I don't. It's it's weird. It's it's. I don't know. I've never seen one where Wolverine cuts through the shield yet. No. Uh, what what I remember is vibranium is more durable, but adamantium is harder. Which just sounds like a lot more, of more durable. <laughs> sounds like semantics to say from Marvel writers, so they wouldn't yeah. get caught up in a weird conflict of right. like, oh no, you totally wrote it this way, and now you screwed it up. But yes, adamantium can cut through vibranium, but um, vibranium can shatter adamantium. So it's you know, rock hmm. versus scissors versus paper. Don't drink, don't smoke. Big question is, what happens if Wolverine tries to cut Thor's hammer? Yeah, but see, that's magic. <laughs> like, no one else... Wait, who's the only other person to be able to pick up Thor's hammer besides Thor? Uh, Anybody else? Captain I thought America if you, nudged it. I thought if you picked up Thor's hammer, you became Thor. Well, yeah, depending on the requirements of the plot at the time. Uh, and Storm the, has picked it up. The mm. chat room says that Cap's shield in the comics is adamantium vibranium alloy. What? They changed what? that. They totally changed. Originally, <laughs> it was originally vibranium. They, whatever. I, that's what. That's one reason it's I don't. It's a read new Marvel space anymore. age alloy. Marvel and DC. Oh, I believe it's made out of retcon. <laughs> Why don't we just make it out of? Why don't we make it out of the MacGuffin? <laughs> yeah, Jerks. it's a uh, retcon MacGuffin alloy. <laughs> That's why I refuse to read any DC or Marvel book anymore. Frankie, well, you should have okay. me on your pop culture shows. I can pop culture it up with the best of them. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I'm actually thinking of reviving the uh, Death Match of Death and More Death at some point. And just have a, a rotating schedule weekly where two people come in and they get a randomly assigned superhero or supervillain. Cool. You could have seasons. You know, you could ha play like a you know twenty game season and then have a t playoffs at the end. Sure, sure. Could you go I mean, all it, it all FSL depends on how, how big your um, starting seed is. I mean, if you've got thirty two characters, then it's sixteen weeks just to narrow it down to sixteen, and then another eight weeks to narrow it down to eight, right. and so on. Go sixty four. Why not? Yeah, yeah. Just go full we'll hog. Do it forever. Yeah, two, uh, a two-year run. The only... What was it? Uh, so I think the um, the best kind of matchup I've ever read about, and believe it or not, it was Wizard Magazine, uh, is where... Remember Ble uh, was Gleek from uh, the Wonder Twins monkey? Yes. Faces off after... Who was the monkey from uh, Space Ghost? The one with Jan and Jace. Oh, right. So those two, those two simians faced off in a fight. Rack. Was it? I think so. I thought that was the answer. No, insight. wait. No. Gleep? Not bleep. Uh, Gleep? Gleep. Then there's the monkey. Blip the monkey. Chim Chim was from no, Speed Chim Racer. No, Chim Chim was from Speed Racer. Gleep. I don't know. There's Gleeks from Super Friend. Ah, dang it. I think it's Blip Blip. Blip. Yeah, Blip. Yeah. Blip and Gleek. That was the best one. Gauchim says, like an Iron Chef of Superhero Smackdown. What if you did an Iron Chef? <laughs> That's horrible. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> Iron Had Chef. to do with monkeys. That's all. Nope. You can read all the emails. <laughs> <laughs> no, after I read about that dog meat festival in China. You know, I bet those pictures still disturb me. It's really disturbing. Really disturbing. Yep. Like, even if I'm not a pet guy, and Tom can attest <laughs> to that, and I'm not a pet guy at all. Uh, Says the guy who looked at my dog once and said, four drumsticks. Grabbed her oh. paws and said four drumsticks. <laughs> That's actually true. Uh, I'm trying to make it sound a little better. But it was yeah, all it was in good scary. fun. Was, I think it's because there's still a lot. Hey, I don't want to go into it. <laughs> very disturbing. Very disturbing. It was the, one of the top stories on the BBC this morning. I've been hearing about it all weekend from my wife because Eileen, you know, she's a big dog lover, so she finds all these horrible dog stories all the time. She just seeks them sounds, out. Sounds like a sounds like a show. Yeah, uh, but uh, then it was like right up there next to you know uh, negotiations over the Greek debt. Good fun. It's the first day in a while that I've preferred to read about negotiations over the Greek debt. 
Actually, today was a good day to start because it, it was actually quite nice. The, um, the Swedish um, general stock index went up 2.83% after a lot of concerns these past uh, two weeks. Mm. Is so that a solstice months? bump? Something on those lines. Yeah. The euphoria of like endless summers <laughs> or endless days in the, of summer? Something yeah. on those lines, yeah. Like, oh, it it's celebrated, uh, the Swedish flag is now 109 years old. Wow. Happy oh. birthday, flag. A very intricate designed flag, I might add. Right. Blue with a yellow cross. Uh, so they think, I guess they didn't come to a deal yet, but there, there are positive steps, I take it. They put yeah, a proposal they, out. They said, right. oh, we, don't, we didn't have time to look at it yet, which is a negotiating deck. Uh, I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure a bunch of people are crap in their Oh, drawers. Swift Justice was the title, by the way. Yes. Showbot Reminder yeah. was just asking. Thought that Still was sounds obvious, like a but Chuck I guess Norris we didn't actually say it. Swift Justice, starring Chuck Norris. And Taylor Swift. Yep. I think Taylor gets first billing. It could be like Taylor Swift is like his granddaughter, and he has to, re and she has to rescue him, and he has to, she has to, like relearn all his roundhouse kicks, and whatever Swift. else that Chuck Norris does. He's got the legs for it. Swift Justice was a UPN TV series that aired for four months in 1996, starring James McCaffrey as a former NYPD detective and Navy SEAL getting kicked off the force handles the cases the police can't by becoming a private detective. Of isn't that, course. Isn't that kind of a variation on the equalizer? Isn't that kind of a variation on every cop slash detective television cop series up until 1996? PI. Yeah. Actually, I mean, had, I, it, had it been done today, he wouldn't be a former detective. He would be a former psychic or a former um, yeah. you know, paleontologist or something. I will confess the best version of that, though, is the A-Team. Sure. Because it's an ensemble cast. The rest are usually just solo. Mm -hmm. But when you have an ensemble, it tends to make it a little more interesting. Well, it makes it more uh, satisfying when your plan comes together. Yes. <laughs> and actually, you know what? That was like the best. Per like, so Knight Rider had Kit, and Kit would save the day. Airwolf had the helicopter. But A-Team had Let's Build the Thing. And it was, it was like the first DIY show as a kid I ever watched, even before This Old House. Before MacGyver. Even before yeah. MacGyver, it's like, let's DIY ourselves some explosives using coffee cans, gunpowder, and some other stuff, and we'll tape it together. Duct tape. Joss well, Whedon should tape. reboot the A-Team. Well, the mm -hmm. last one. The last reboot was very disappointing. Yeah, yeah. Had Bradley Cooper in it, was that right? Yep. Yeah, Bradley Cooper, but they also had Liam Neeson as uh, George Rappard's character. Uh, yeah. And Charlton Copley. I mean, you can never go wrong with Charlton Copley. He was Murdoch. And then he was, uh, what's his name in, um, what's the uh, South, what's the, what's the one with the South African aliens? District uh, 9? District, District 9. Yeah. Joss Whedon should reboot Quantum Leap. No, okay. let it rest. No. I want Quantum Leap. More. More. You, know, you say that and you see it's like, I don't need this. Well, I'm in a woman's I body. Want big, big, I want a today version of it. I think... You're, what you're reacting to is the storytelling level of sophistication of the late 80s, early 90s. And what I would tell you is that many great concepts from those eras have been successfully rebooted into much more sophisticated uh, uh, allegories of our time. And I like. think like, uh, well, it's not the right decade, but uh, a one Battlestar Galactica that jumps the 70s. to mind. I, you're, you're making a distinction without a difference. I'm telling you that the storytelling level of sophistication in the 70s and the 80s is, is, was very good for its time. It was very good sophisticated time travel storytelling, but it could certainly use a reboot today no. with all the complex if issues could, that television is able to capture. If you're going to reboot time travel's mood, you need to reboot Time Train. All right? Or Voyagers. How about Voyagers? to have a series about a time traveler who goes back in time and reboots television series the first time they air. <laughs> Isn't that Netflix? I'm uh, pretty sure the guys who run Google are time travelers. <laughs> I, I, just, I Actually, the more I think about that stupid joke, the more I like this idea. You could have yeah. a different show every week. I like you it. You mean like an anthology show? Like yeah, and stories? you're re rebooting those shows. Bef as their pilots are being produced. Mm -hmm. It's somebody uh, who's I mean, seen the whole run and like comes in and tries to correct all the mistakes. Right. No, you, can't, you know what? That would make for a very, I don't know, you can't have anything too perfect. Yeah, but that's the thing, right? Can he really change no, he the can't. course of the that's, show? That's the lesson. That's what Scott Bakula learned until he quantum leaped into Enterprise. 
And then <laughs> Another that was favorite show of mine. Which also had time travel. Mm-hmm. He, he, he just didn't have an old guy as a hologram in Ziggy. There's a good tie-in episode <laughs> where, young, where we uh, find out that, uh, that uh, what was his name? Sam oh, Beckett. Bacula or Sam, Sam Beckett. Beckett. No, no, not, not Sam. Ca- Captain Archer. The Captain Archer actually got leaped into. That before. would be great. Huh? I think that would be awesome. Agree. That's one thing I would get behind. Let's kickstart Star- it. Star Trek Quantum Leap, um, directed by uh, Damon Lindorf. Quantum Star Trek. And it's Star all Trek. because of Q. Yes. <laughs> of course. Or, that, or the weird guy from, uh, from Enterprise who nobody liked. I liked him. The guy Wait, who was served guy? as the, the... On Enterprise, the guy who was like the future... Guide who's oh, like, oh, yeah, we he was, time he was, again. He was only oh, in like section thirty-seven. Episodes. Yeah, in one of them he died. Yeah, uh, he, they finally killed him off because his character just kept coming in and going, "Dusas Mashina again." You know, it's interesting that Q ended up being what the holodeck was used for, like, like the longest time in the Next Generation. He was just a plot vehicle to like, hey, let's do something that's totally out of the ordinary. Mm-hmm. And I never understood, if you get locked in the hollow deck, isn't there like an emergency push button that just says, okay, turn everything off? There is, but it, it was malfunctioning, Roger. We tried pushing it and it didn't work. Something is wrong. I mean, if you had a, a carnival ride that couldn't like have an emergency <laughs> shot, people would like, okay, no one goes to this thing ever again until we fix it. Yeah, the the Enterprise would would be in in uh, space dock for. And then, like, if it, the holodeck's so amazing, why don't they just kidnap people they need to? Like, like they're doing a diplomatic mission or whatever. They just throw them in there and they give them some weird fantasy, like Fantasy Island. And they learn about the, you know, they learn their lesson and they come out all like good. Prime Directive. <laughs> you can, well, that's a spinoff series. That's my Star Trek spinoff series. Now we've we've produced several series for you, dear Hollywood. Please take these ideas and make them realities, and then send us checks. Woohoo! And I am out of the post. I will go in the post. Thank you, everyone. Uh, stay Thank tuned you. for Cord Killers later on DiamondClub.tv, immediately following this episode of Rebooting Past Series.